Now, the one and a half litre engines in these cars produce phenomenal amounts of power, and that wouldn't be possible without highly sophisticated microprocessor engine management systems. Systems which are considered so important and so secret that Renault wouldn't even let us show you what's under the bonnet. But the cost of developing and testing these systems has proved to be prohibitively expensive. So much so that certain teams have successfully lobbied the sports governing body for a change of rules next season. A change in favour of engines using brute force rather than microelectronic subtlety. Which is ironic when you consider that many ordinary road cars are now being fitted with microelectronic engine management systems every bit as sophisticated as those on the racing cars. But before looking at the microelectronics, back to basics and how a car engine works. In a normal engine, a mixture of petrol and air is sucked in as the piston moves down the cylinder. Then the valve is closed and the mixture is compressed as the piston moves back up. The spark ignites the mixture and the resulting explosion forces the piston down again. On the final stroke, the waste gases are pushed out so the cycle can start again. Well, the trick is to get the engine to work at its most efficient under lots of different road conditions. And that's done by adjusting the timing of the spark, that's the ignition, and the timing of the fuel injection. Now, in this car, the timings are controlled by two microprocessor-based engine management systems, one for the ignition and one for the fuel injection. Before any new engine is even put in a car, it undergoes an extensive test program. It's subjected to a whole range of speeds and loads, and for every set of conditions, the engineers can vary the fuel mixture and the spark timings to get the optimum settings. The results are usually referred to as the engine map and the technique as engine mapping. It's this set of results, the engine map, which forms the basis of the software for the engine management system in the finished car. But before that, the map has to be checked on a prototype car on the road. This lap-held computer is connected directly to the engine management system, and it gives a constant readout of all the variables. Here, for example, we have engine speed and coolant temperature, as well as advance angle, that's the spark timing, and air-fuel ratio here. It also allows the engineers to make minor alterations, uh, say, to the ignition timing, and note the results. In this way, the engine map is constantly refined and improved. And that set of data, the engine map, is stored in memory in the control systems as a range of settings. The memories are made up by 8x8 eight eight arrays, 64 memory locations, or 64 boxes. Each location, each box that is, can store one setting for the engine. For instance, the timing of the ignition for a particular engine speed and load. To select the best setting at any one moment, the processor checks out what's going on through a number of sensors. It senses engine speed, the load on the engine, airflow, coolant temperature, outside temperature, and what the accelerator pedal is doing. The inputs from the sensors go into the processor and are used to address the array, to look up the box with the best setting. That value is then sent out to either the fuel injection or the ignition. A classic control system, but not exactly revolutionary. But one of the biggest problems facing the engineers was the speed of operation. Modern car engines run at thousands of revolutions per minute, so there are literally only milliseconds to process the values. To overcome the problem, the processor is selective about what it looks at. Every revolution, it has to look at the inputs which change rapidly, like the load, the engine speed, and the movement of the accelerator. And it has to send out the rapidly changing values to the ignition. The software has a fast loop to deal with these. But other inputs, such as the coolant temperature and outside temperature, only change slowly. So the processor only looks at them every now and again. A slow loop in the software deals with these. Even so, things can still go wrong. Under the bonnet of a car is a very hostile place for a micro, so the processor is designed to guard against the real world, to cope with unexpected events. And the programmers have also come up with a neat idea called the watchdog. That's an electronic timer that resets each time the software cycles around its various functions. There, it's just reset now. However, if for some reason the program hangs up, let's say it gets caught in a loop, 
which it will do any moment now. There, it's caught in a loop, but the watchdog timing circuitry just keeps going. And after a preset time, the watchdog switch detects that there's some problem and the whole system is reset. It's reset automatically to the top of the program. The driver would only notice a slight misfire of the engine. Now, micro-owners who've tried programming in machine code and have had to turn off the machine after a program crash will appreciate the elegance of that watchdog. Well, there's no doubt that microprocessor engine management systems do give better control. It may seem like a fairy tale, but cars can now be as much as 30% more powerful and yet have reduced fuel consumption and reduced pollution. And now, microprocessors are also being used to enhance the showroom appeal of cars. For instance, how about electrically powered seats and wing mirrors with four memories? In this car, you just press one button and the seat will automatically readjust itself to the position that you like to sit in. And the wing mirrors will do the same thing. In fact, there's about nine different angles within this seat to play around with to get it absolutely comfortable. So setting it up is quite a time-consuming business. But with this, you set it up once, program it into one of the memories, and then when you want to change your car and your, your sitting position, it does it for you. Now, there's also in the, on the central console, there we are, uh, a lit-up display showing you what's going on around the car, and that acts as a warning. For instance, here it's telling me that one of the doors is open. Of course, I know one of the doors is open, but if I'd neglected to shut it properly, that would be a very useful warning.